Nepal, a non-aligned neutral, determined to be friends with all the world. Grateful to China for this fine road which leads from Chinese-occupied Tibet to the Nepalese capital, Kathmandu, pointing towards India. Roads that have helped open up a country that less than 20 years ago was practically inaccessible. Kathmandu, one of the most magnificently adorned cities in the world, holy to Hindus and Buddhists. A thriving centre for many long centuries, but only open to the outside world since 1951, when the present king's father overthrew a regime which had kept Nepal utterly isolated. But into this ancient culture creeps remorselessly the Western way of life. The old-time traveller did when in Rome as the Romans did. Today's tourist will only spend his money in a home from home. So up go the air-conditioned hotels in that might-be-anywhere style of architecture, and into them go the manifold glories of Western civilization. A new breed of people comes willy-nilly into existence. Six months ago, this smart young casino employee was a Tibetan peasant. Tradition is dished up to tourists in forms like this absurd devil dance performed in a car park in the light of bonfires drenched in kerosene. Which is not to say that genuine thrills and experiences cannot be found. An enormous tract of jungle in the Terai has been set aside as a game reserve. Tiger, rhino, crocodile, all manner of game abounds. It's more dangerous than it looks. More than once, a charging rhino has brought down a jumbo load of tourists, but without, as yet, fatal consequences. Aid, tourism. Nepal needs both. As, with a rising standard of living, Nepal ventures belatedly into the 20th century. On this day, the Dalai Lama speaks to thousands of his fellow countrymen, come from far and wide to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the bloodily suppressed uprising of the Tibetan people against their Chinese masters. The Dalai Lama is 34. Astrologers and priests chose him at the age of two from a poor farming family as the child into whom the previous Dalai Lama had been reborn. Superstition? Perhaps. Yet it would be hard to imagine a better choice. Against enormous odds, he has kept his scattered people utterly united in their faith and national identity. But soon the speeches give way to dance and sun. Dances that are more than just enjoyment, that are one more way of preserving the essence of home. Can exiled Tibetans preserve their national identity, or will they in time become absorbed into the ways of their host countries? Who can tell? High in the mountains, the Dalai Lama waits in exile, an exile that may well endure for all his lifetime.
Stanley Beach, one of the world's great surfing beaches, not far from the spot where the first British settlers landed in Australia more than 175 years ago. And even in those hard living days, landings could hardly have been less comfortable than this. Today's settlers, the new Australians of the 1960s, are reaching Australia's shores from many countries at a rate of around 135,000 a year and finding their way even into such traditional Aussie strongholds as the life-saving clubs. And here's a present-day reminder of how it all began. That first landing of 1,030 soldiers, sailors and convicts in 1788 on a day now called Australia Day. It's the day when thousands more migrants become real Aussies and take the oath of allegiance to Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of Australia. The day of more than a hundred naturalization ceremonies. To become full citizens, the new Aussies must have lived five years in the country and be able to speak English. But it doesn't mean goodbye to the customs and culture they've grown up with. Migration on the scale Australia knows today means a two-way traffic in ideas and habits and tastes. In the bigger cities, a growing cosmopolitan trend. For in this town, nine out of ten people are migrants. Yugoslavs, Italians, Germans, English, Irish, Scottish and Welsh, Spaniards and Greeks. Thirty and more different nationalities. The migrants who find it easiest to get used to Australia are the youngsters. They merge naturally into a new generation of Australians. A country whose population of 11 million today may grow six times over in their lifetime. A country in a hurry to make a splash in the modern world. among the snow peaks of the Andes, La Paz in Bolivia. The air is so thin that new arrivals feel giddy. In the high streets of La Paz, you can see for yourself the Indians of Bolivia, squatting on the ground, marketing and strolling about, dignified and composed, with the women wearing their extraordinary bowler hats. But colorful travel pictures can't hide the great problem of Bolivia. The poverty and disease and backwardness of these Indians, whose traditions go directly back to the Incas, but who haven't yet taken their place in the 20th century. There is no need for things to be so grim in Bolivia. The trouble is human stubbornness. Bolivia is really two countries. One, the high plateau, icy, unfertile, unfit for human beings. But most of the human beings insist on living here. The other is a rich tropical land, only a few hours away but people won't go down there. Down the mountain road that falls 12,000 feet in 50 miles lies a green world where crops grow almost without asking. But the little towns there are half empty and the main business is smuggling over the border to Brazil. Fortunately, there is some more constructive work being done down here and in a small way, Britain is helping. In these lowlands, some of the finest coffee in the world could be grown, but the results haven't been good because the Bolivians don't have the know-how yet. Now they've got Michael Dixon, a young Scotsman sent out from Britain to help them. He'll be here for a couple of years, and then he hopes they'll be helping themselves. That's always providing the Indians will come down from the cold plateau to the valleys and plant and pick the coffee.
This is a scene that made history. The first visit ever by a British reigning monarch to Chile. Thousands cheered the Queen in the autumn of 1968. Since then, thousands in Britain have been looking at the map. Often called the English of the South, Chileans have strong links with Britain. This goodwill grew from the British sailors, soldiers and adventurers who helped win Chile's War of Independence from Spain some 150 years ago. Many stayed to help shape the country. As enduring as the statues are the traditions, especially in the services, the Chilean Air Force flies British hunter fighters. The country's banking, commerce and industry were built up with the help of people from Britain. There's no doubt about the origin of that post box. Chileans are highly conscious of attractive presentation. The London image is a big selling angle. British recording artists are tops. At the Anglo-Chilean Institute, inaugurated by the Queen, 400 apprentices a year will learn their trades, mainly on machines presented by Britain. During her stay, the Queen planted a sapling. It was a traditional commemoration of a royal visit. It stands today as a symbol not only of friendship, but of new opportunities. Will it grow into a sturdy tree, or just slowly wilt away? The next few years will tell. <laughs> 